Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Latin American Webinar of Physics. Today, we are going to have the last uh, webinar from not from this season, but we are going to have a pause for the for the summer holidays or winter holidays, depend, depends on the hemisphere. So today is going to be the last webinar until uh, the end of August. But anyway, the, the webinar of today is, is very interesting. We are going to have here, we're going to host uh, Francisco de Anda. Uh, he's a researcher at, at the Teta Tepatitlan Institute for Theoretical Studies in, in Mexico. And he got the, his PhD from the Universidad, Universidad de Guadalajara in Mexico also. So uh, Francisco, welcome. And the talk of, he, uh, of Francisco is sculpting the standard model from E8 uh, full unification. Don't forget for the, for the people following us in the, in, the, in the live transmission that you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and also in our social network. And okay, Francisco, welcome to Law Physics. Thank you. So I'm gonna share the screen. Yeah, you can see that, right? Okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so. Okay, so the talk is about the sculpting the standard model from the E8 and full unification. So our, our starting point is, of course, the standard model. And how we see the standard model is like the, the a bunch of Legos of which the whole universe is made of. So we have the, the fermions in here, we have the Higgs and of course the forces. And this is all defined by the symmetries of the standard model, which is the gauge symmetry and the Poincaré symmetry, the space-time symmetry, which is in here. And of course, it, it, to be fully defined, we need six, uh, 26 real parameters. But this is too much. I, I, I don't know how to say it by memory. It's, re, it's really long, a, a, lot, a lot of information. So I want to make it smaller. I want to make it more nice. And the way we, we do that is by going uh, beyond the standard model. And what we do in beyond the standard model is to enlarge the symmetries, either the gauge symmetry or the Poincaré symmetry. So if we enlarge it like this, uh, we by through flavor symmetries, we paste Legos like this. By guts, unification, we do it in that way. And with SUSI and extra dimensions, we do it this way. So one question arises in my mind, uh, can we do it with a, can we paste it enough so that everything is just one big, very symmetrical Lego? And that is the aim of the talk, to show you that it's possible to, to instead of having these lots of Legos, have a really big one. And the way to do this is through the uh, exceptional chain. And this is not new. This was done in the 80s, so I'm going to describe it briefly. So the, the standard model is built with this gauge symmetry, and this is the full field content of the standard model. And look, you can keep an eye on in here, which is the thinking diagrams. And this is the, the guiding principle for the exceptional chain. So of course, the standard model needs uh, 26 real parameters. So the next step in the chain is SU5. And if you see, the first thing that you notice is that the, the vectors, so in here you, you had uh, the first line were scalars, the second line were fermions, and the, for, the third line were vectors, uh, the three forces. In SU5, we don't have three forces, we have a single one. So SU5 means gauge field unification. The next step in the, in the chain is SO10. So instead of having to state different fermions, now I have all of the fermions in, of a single family in a single representation. So SO10 means fermion unification. This is the most used uh, unification group. The next step would be E6 and something interesting happening, happens in E6. So if you see the fermions and the Higgs lie in the same representation. So E6 suggests that uh, scalars and, and fermions must be unified too. So you, we want it to be SUSI. Actually E6 only makes sense if you have SUSI. So now I erased one line and now we have a chiral superfield and a vector superfield. Now we have fermion Higgs unification. The next step, step is E7 which is not that much used. But here is the first time that instead of having these three times, 27, three times because of the three families, now we have a single representation. So E7 means uh, family, the whole family uh, unification. However, there is a problem with E7, is that it is a real group and the standard model has chiral representations. But 
the way to, to solve this is to or be folding. So we have enlarged before by enlarging to the Poncaire by adding Susi in here. Now we, go, we are going to enlarge the Poncaire by adding extra dimensions. And that way we can solve the fact that E7 is uh, real. So that when we go to E7, we kind of want extra dimensions. Here, here we added two, this is six extra dimensions. Now the next and final step is E8. And again, we see, but as it happened before, the same representation for both of us, for both of these uh, fields. And that this suggests either n equal four SUSI or n equal one SUSI in 10 dimensions. Since we're already in extra dimensional model, we go to 10 dimensions and this is the end. This is a big Lego. The, but everything we have in uh, little Legos, now we have a very symmetrical one. So in the end, we can say that the end of the exceptional chain is of course here, E8. You can see that it, it already said E8 in there. However, the, the, this is, these are not new ideas, of course, but these ideas were grabbed by string theorists because n equal one SUSI, 10 dimensions and E8 arise naturally into, into, in string theory. However, these are not, has not been studied uh, carefully without the string theory setup. So this is what I'm gonna talk about is a purely QFT, not, not strings uh, setup, uh, setup. So we have uh, 10 dimensions, uh, QFT, n equal one super young mills based on E8. So we have a single super field, which is the gauge field uh, accompanied by, the, by its bio Majorana Fermi. However, there's, there's a big problem. If I build a, a QFT in 10 dimensions with this, with this setup, so I have, this is my full field content, which is one vector and one fermion. Of course, it is in the adjoint, which is also the fundamental representation of E8, which is at 248 dimensional. When I decompose that into four dimensions and into the standard model, it breaks into one vector, four by fermion, six scal scalars. The 248 breaks into 99, standard model representations and of course, an infinite set of KK modes and everything is real. So this is really complicated. This may seem that it is too far from us, that this SUSI 10 d 8 is way, way far from, or from the world. However, there is a way, there are steps to go and connect and that's the orbifold compactification. And the orbifold compactification looks like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain it uh, without too much detail uh, in a bit. So this is the full model. I'm not gonna add or change anything in the model. So this is my full, uh, as when they present uh, got, they present like a table of fields. So this is my full table of fields. This is everything I'm going to do the, on the, with the model and I'm gonna not going to add absolutely anything. So I still have a single field, a single super field, but I have this, uh, the extra dimensions are already folded this way. So we have two set trees and a, and a Wilson line. I'm gonna explain it in a bit what does this mean. But what I'm going to try to convince is that these stairs that go uh, from SUSI E8 into the, the uh, standard model actually go are really, really nice to go down to. So this is what we're going to do now. Th let's go down these stairs. So starting from extra dimensions, this would be the symmetry. So we have, Simple SUSI, one supersymmetry, the Poincaré symmetry of extra dimensions, and E8. But there are big problems in here. If we, if I have the translations, then 10, 10 translations, that means that we have open extra dimensions. And of course, that's not true because we don't see uh, more than four. And there's another problem with the Lorentz symmetry is that when, when we enlarge the Lorentz symmetry, just one with the extra dimensions, then all of the decompositions are real. There is no chirality. This is the same problem with E8. So the solution is to not have full, the full Poincaré symmetry of the extra dimensions, but to have them all refolded. So the all refold means that I don't have the complete Poincaré. I have, of course, the 4D the Poincaré is sacred, so I don't touch it. So the four translations is there are there, but the six extra dimensional trans translations are uh, divided by the lattice group. So that means compactified, now they're compact. And I, I also break the extra dimensional Lorentz group. So the, the orbifold group. So we, I have an incomplete Poincaré group instead of the, of the full Poincaré group. So how, how do we do this? As I said, 
I don't have to touch the 4D Poncares because it's sacred. So the, the lattice group, it's the integers to the six because there are six extra dimensions and the extra dimensional Lorentz. So the only extra dimensional part is SO6 because there are six extra dimensions. So I can do any rotations. So I can divide by a discrete uh, subgroup of SO6, which is uh, isomorphic to SU4. So it has to be this discrete because otherwise, if it, it, if, if it were continuous, that would kill some degrees of freedom. And that, that would mean I don't have extra dimensions. So I, I'm going to restrict to abelian or refolding because it's simpler and because it, it allows me to do more, much more things than uh, non abelian things. So the most general abelian or refolding would be three sets. If I don't do anything and I just compactify uh, the result from n equal one SUSY. Uh, in 10 dimensions would be n equal four SUSY. If I have a single set in general, I will have n equal two SUSY. If I have two sets, I will have n equal one SUSY. And if I, I have no, not set, so these, uh, if, sorry, if I have the three of them, I will have no remaining SUSY. So our setup is to choose two. That means that these uh, overfolding conditions preserve n equal one SUSY in the end, but they are broken by the Wilson line, as I'll, I'll say uh, a bit later. So I'm gonna talk about what does this mean be, be, besides these numbers. So an orbifold means, I, I start with the, oh, I'm gonna talk about just two extra dimensions because I can talk about two extra dimensions. I cannot talk about six extra dimensions, but I can talk about two. So the first thing is to build the, the, the lattice group divides me from the whole plane, which is infinite in everywhere, into this discrete uh, box, which is in here. So the what we do to compactify here is identify the green dotted line with the green dotted line and the red dotted line with the red dotted line. That's bring, that brings me a torus, okay? So this is the compact space time for two extra dimensions. Now, this is just the torus. Now, that, let's see what does set three does. Le just uh, as a remark, just see that the dotted, dotted lines and the purple lines uh, just coincide in here and in here. Now the set three, what it does is this triangle the, the, the is divided into three equal triangles and then you rotate it and paste it in here. Then you rotate the other one and paste it in here. And you do the other the same thing with the other triangle. So this is the set, the action of the set three. Note, very interestingly, that the red dotted line, the uh, green dotted line and the purple one are identified. So if I go back to the torus, it means that if I have the torus, I paste these three lines together, which is really, really weird to do. And, it, and we cannot do it exactly, but in the end it will look something like this. So this is the orbifold for two extra dimensions. And the important thing is that the, it has these singularities. These are singular points in the extra dimensions. This is not a continuous space time. And exactly these singular points is what breaks the symmetry. So this is important, the important fact from a before. So of course, this is two dimensions. If I, if I were to write the six, it would look something more like this. Okay, so now the model is built with, a, this is the full symmetry of the model, which is, Compact extra dimensions and the and the orbifolded the set three cross set three, and the, there is an important change in here that I did, which is this is not a direct product. This is a semi-direct direct product. And why is it a semi-direct product? Is because these groups, the set six and the set three and set three, do not commute with E eight. I make them not to commute with E eight. And that and why do I do that? Because these groups do break the extra dimensional Poincaré, but I wanted to also break the E8. So they break together. When I compactify, everything is broken into something. And of course, what I want is to break into the standard model because E8 is too much. So this is the setup. I'm, I'm just going to give you the motivation of why C3 and the charges that we use. So every, every rot C3 means some rotation as, as we rotated the triangle. And what I want to uh, also do is rotate, do a E8 rotation. So a gauge transformation. What I want to apply is this 
Q8F, Q8C. So what I want to do is Q8 is going to be the charge of the T8, lambda 8 of the matrices of SU3. So one is going to be accompanied with, with the SU3 family and the other one by the SU3 color. Why set three? It's very, it's very simple to, to understand. Is because this is the lambda eight. It's one, one minus two. We all know this matrix. But if we make it mod three, so one, one, and minus two mod three is one. So this is the identity matrix. So what I'm saying is that these are refolding. If I if I do an identity matrix in the SU3, what I'm what I'm saying is that I am preserving that SU3. So one of the set trees preserves the flavor symmetry, the SU3 flavor, and the other one preserves the SU3 color, which of course we want. This is the reasoning of why we chose this. So the breaking happens like this. In the beginning, I have E8, this really large symmetry. One of the, set of the C trees breaks E8 into E6, preserving SU3 color. Another C3 breaks I, I, E8 into E6 cross SU3 flavor, but the intersection is this quaternification. And the Wilson lines break this quaternification into the standard model. And in the, it, they also break SUSI. Of course, I, I just break it down in here, but this all happens simultaneously because of, all refolding happens simultaneously. So we have E8 above compactification and the standard model below compactification. So this is, this is very interesting because in, in UFT, this makes it free of gauge anomalies because this is a real group and below we have the standard model. But of course, it is not enough to have the standard model symmetry. We want the standard model field content too. So how does that happen? In the beginning, as, as I said, we have a single super field. So we have a, a super field that depends on the X mu, which are, which are the four dimensions and three ex complex extra dimensions. Three complex makes six. So a single uh, vector super field will decompose into 10D, a single 10D vector super field will decompose into one 4D vector super field and three chiral super fields. One way to see that if you focus on the scalars, uh, sorry, in the bosons, it's really simple because if you see the, the vector has 10 degrees of, uh, of freedom, four of them go into the vector, the 10D vector has 10 degrees of freedom, four of them go into the 4D vector and two, the other six uh, make three pairs which go into each chiral superfield. So this is the decomposition. If I didn't do any or refolding, this would be in the adjoint representation, the 248, and each of these guys would also be at 248, which is too much. We don't want that. But the orbit folding breaks E8. And what happens is that the vector in here will have the representation, of course, of the unbroken gauge group by the rotations, which is the quaternification that I showed. One of the chi chiral fields will have the representations of the left quarks and an extra uh, triplet, which is vector-like. Another chiral field will have the representations of the right quarks and another chiral field will have the Higgses, the leptons, right-handed neutrinos, and something that's a flavon which behaves like a right-handed neutrino. And the Wilson line, it, it behaves like a web. So it also has a web. Uh, it, it, we will assume the most general web that does not break the standard model. So the right-handed neutrinos are not uh, charged on the standard model, so we can give it a web. And both of them, the, the right-handed neutrino and the flavon, we give them a web. This is not actually a web. It comes from the Wilson line. It comes from the extra dimensional profiles. So it, there's no potential. So one interesting thing about this Wilson line uh, web is that uh, it generates a D-type breaking of SUSI because it is not real. So it's not D-flat. So it breaks SUSI at the same compactification scale. So uh, it, in general, this is uh, too simplistic, but it gives uh, all scalars a mass uh, like this. And the Gaginos happens at two loop. So the, the, the Gagino masses are much smaller. But this is not that, as interesting as what happens in here. The first thing that we know is that this decomposition gives me a single 
determine the super potential, which is going to be phi one, phi two, phi three. That's the only super potential that I have. And that translates into this. So this, if you see DL, you, you can think of the Higgs. So Higgs, left quark, right-handed quark. That means that at leading order, the superpotential only has quark masses. It doesn't give uh, masses to all of the quarks, only to two. But there are subleading corrections. So two, mass, two, two quarks get their mass at leading order, then there are corrections, and the, the ma mass matrix fills up with subleading corrections. Next, the leptons cannot have a, a mass at, at leading order. And why? Because the leading order would be LLL, meaning L cubed. But since we have a bunch of SU3s, the, the coupling must be anti-symmetric and it vanishes. So the main contribution comes at, at with two insertions of this D and it fills up the entire matrix at the, at, at the first order. And then we have right-handed neutrinos with the Majorana masses. So even without seeing the structure, we, we can conclude a few things coming from the model. First, that quarks receive uh, masses at leading order, but leptons do not. So there's going to be a hierarchy be between quarks and leptons. Quarks must be are naturally heavier than leptons. The next step is that quarks need three steps to fill up the, ma the mass matrix. So it's going to be hierarchical. That means that there's going to be a small mixing in quarks, while leptons appears at one step. The, so most of all of the entries in the lepton mass matrix are about the same order. So that, that calls for large mixing, which is what we see. And then we have uh, six right-handed neutrinos with major, large Majorana masses. And that means that we have the CISO and small neutrinos. So as I told you, this is a very viable standard model setup of course, without specifying parameters. So this is really, really nice. And as, as I said before, this is the only thing that we did. I haven't added anything else to that. So uh, in principle, conceptually, the standard model is there, the full standard model, all of the, all of the fields and all of the couplings as, uh, as I desire them. So that's, of course, that's not the full setup because I have only talked to you about this, but we can play with the parameters. We're not going to play with all of them. So when I say that there's one complex parameter coming from in here, it's the gauge coupling, which is complex. And the 13 complex parameters is, I'm, I'm gonna play with two radii of the extra dimensions and the Wilson line beds. So I'm not gonna go through everything, but I'm just gonna play with the gauge coupling and the radii of the extra dimensions. Why? Because to be a consistent gut, we need gauge coupling unification. Otherwise, the, this is not a gut. We need the, the, the couplings to unify it into something. So uh, as I said, below compactification, we have the standard model and we know that the standard model does not unify. But this is not just the standard model. At some point, there are, there are SUSI contributions and we know that the SUSI fields kind of unify. So the existence of extra fields bump the lines so that they can uh, cross at some point. However, we have extra dimension then, and extra dimensions is, are really more interesting than SUSI because the running for the couplings become, uh, instead of the logarithmic running, it becomes a power law. So be, that, the reason uh, for that is that if you see, this is the bump the, that does a few extra fields. And this is the bump that happens when you add an infinite amount of fields because KK modes are added and there are too many fields, it, of course, each, is heavier and contributes less, but there are infinite amount. So there's a lot of change in the running and let's see what happens with, with us. So in the beginning, we have kind of like the standard model in here. In here, there's Gageno Higgsino masses. That's the lightest extra fields that we have up to this scale, about this scale. At this scale, the KK modes start playing a role. They start acting on the running and something funny happens. So there's a huge change in, in, the, in the running. We're going to play with two radii because there are, as I said, there are three tori. So each can, each can have a different size. So this is the largest, the, the largest of them all. The largest, uh, the KK mode coming from the largest act first. This bump here is a Wilson line. 
So you, you see that they kind of want to meet, but they don't. Here, two of them all already meet. So we let them play a little more. So the, we separate the two uh, extra dimensions, the sizes of the extra dimensions. This is a six dimensional space. And you see that here already, they are all almost already meet. They actually uh, meet. But then you have to take into account that there are more KK modes that are at, at smaller sizes and they continue running up until here, the unification. So this is a really non-standard uh, running for the couplings. So we have, but what we can say is in on the going the other way. In here you have ten dimensions. Then the the smallest, the largest, uh, yeah, the largest extra dimensions you you integrate out. The KK modes act for a bit until they disappear. Then there's a bit where there's a, a six-dimensional theory. Then you integrate out that. The AKK mode center into, into playing a role. Then the Wilson line kills some of them. Some the other ones live for a little bit more, and then the running up until the, the standard model coupling. So there's a few. There's a one interesting thing is that effectively we have n equal four SUSI. So there's the beta the beta function uh, vanishes there. So there's no more running. So this is a full running, and there's a plenty of interesting things to see here. The first and most important of them all is the scale as, at which they unify, which is 10 to the seven GEVs. This is really, really non-standard. This is almost, well, we can say 10 orders of magnitude below the standard unification scale. So this is much, much closer to us. And the first thing that comes into mind, if you think of, of this smaller scale is proton decay. So we have to think on proton decay, luckily, uh, for us, proton decay is very suppressed by a, a bunch of factors, but, we, but the idea is this. This is the leading uh, process that generates proton decay in our model. So if you see, it's really complicated. It's ugly because as it comes, it's really, if you start building the very symmetrical ones for proton decay, they vanish due to the anti-symmetry that is preserved. So this is the leading order for proton decay. And this would be the, the actual decay. And if you see, this is the gauge coupling. It's the gauge coupling to the 18th power because it, at every vertex you get one gauge coupling. And if you see, if you remember when they unify, they unify about, about 10 to the minus two. So the gauge coupling, this is about 10 to the minus two to the 18. So we're kind of safe. We, we have a very, very suppressed proton decay. We analyze this, and this is all the possible setups that we can have. So we can unify at up to 10 to the six GeVs. This is the lowest scale that we can have of unification. Below that, even with that suppression for proton decay, that's too much uh, proton decay. So we cannot go below because we have excessive proton decay and the gluino starts becomes too light. So we can have uh, unification up from 10 to the six up to 10 to the nine. Above 10 to the nine, there is no unification in, in this model. So this is a very interesting setup that we have, we can have a low, low, a much lower scale unification and we cannot have the standard uh, unification scale. It must be lower. So of course, this is, this is the scale. And the, the, another interesting thing is that even though we have, we start from this 10 to the six, we, we can run the Higgs masses and one of them becomes negative at the electroweak scale. So we can generate the electroweak scale from, from this larger scale. So in the end, we have the compactification and the gut at much closer scales that, than ever. And th this can even be achievable uh, to see in some experiment, not, uh, not that far in the future. We have viable, we know that in, in 10 to the 6 PEV, uh, SUSI breaking, it's viable, it's kind of natural. So the model kind of works. So everything, absolutely everything that we see fits and moreover, it, it is within reach. So again, I, I restate, this is the full model. We didn't do anything but play with three parameters to achieve unification. And what we played with this one and with these two, and of course, we didn't say anything about this. And one of the interesting thing is that the full Yukawa sector comes from these parameters. We're, we're working on, on, on working them out. 
And the very nice thing is that once we fix them, this will be fixed by the fitting the Yukawa sector. That would fix absolutely everything else. Every soft SUSI uh, parameter would come from in here too. So if we fit the standard model masses, that gives us, gives us immediately every single other mass of every field. So this is a very nice unification, extremely predictive. And of course, what about gravity? Well, this model does not have gravity. We, we are ignoring it. But to add it, I, I, I can talk a little bit about, about this. There are two ways of adding gravity, either by having the Poincare symmetry and making local, that means uh, adding new degrees of freedom, or the idea that I like more is the emergent gravity, is that if we, if we were to aim to have a full unified theory, gravity must be there. So if gravity were emergent, then gravity would be there. The one way to, um, uh, to talk, this is a, a bit off topic, but when we to have uh, gravity emerge for many theory is to, if you have this, uh, the, this path integral and you limit yourself, instead of integrating over all the configurations of the fields, you limit yourself to, to integrate over the configurations of the fields that preserve the uh, an energy momentum tensor. Because you know, uh, quantum, uh, quantum corrections do not preserve energy, but uh, the off-shell uh, con configurations do not preserve it, but the on-shell do. So what if I limit myself to integrate over only those that preserve? So this is equivalent to integrate over all, but adding a delta function. And the delta function uh, can be also an integral over some variable uh, with the exponential in here. And that's just a graviton. So gravity can emerge if you, this is a graviton without dynamics and it is known by the Sakharov uh, induced gravity that the curvature can arise from in here. So gravity can emerge if you change a little bit in the path integrals. So the details can be here and it, in here it's just a linear gravity but full gravity can come from in here. You can see the details. So even though in this model we didn't do that, we can think it can be fully unified. So we have shown that we can have full EA to the standard model breaking, a viable Yukawa structure. We have a specific SUSI breaking we generate the, the electroweak uh, symmetry breaking we have viable proton decay, it is anomaly free. There are very few pa parameters and most importantly, this is not really, really high. So in the end, we can show you that we can sculpt, that's the reason of the, of the title. We can sculpt the standard model from a single block, which is E8 and, and achieve the standard model only if you use the right chisel. So if you want to see more details, here's the short letter which is easier to read and the full details are in here. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco, for the, for the nice talk. So just to remind you to the people that is following the, the, the transmission that uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and also to follow us in the social network, especially now in this pandemic uh, period. It's very use useful to, to keep in touch with the, the latest results in science. And of course, if you have any questions, please, you can write it in the chat in YouTube. We are gonna read it at the, meanwhile, we started now with the question round for Francisco. So please be free to, to write the question. So uh, let's start with some questions. Maybe somebody from here from the audience want to ask something? I have Nicolas, a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Thanks, Francisco, for the nice talk. So uh, you say that uh, your gut um, uh, energy scale is like 10 to the 7, something like that. Yeah. And it's true that we're used to have this gut scale more at the about 10 to the 16 or something like that. But just out of curiosity, is uh, I mean, this, this sounds like uh, weird or, or shocking, but it's just uh, prejudice, right? There's no yes. like uh, argument for having got scale at 10 to the five, 10 or I don't know. 15. No, so yeah. So the, the, the are, it has been really a strong result and assumption to be 10 to the 16 because it coincides with the SUSI. The SUSI, you, when you add SUSI, it, it unifies at that scale. And then it barely uh, uh, 
beats the proton decay uh, constraints but 10 to the 16. So that's why it has been the standard uh, setup. For us, since, since with the extra dimensions bring down a lot, the, the unification scale and the symmetry uh, makes proton decay very, very suppressed. So we are actually almost barely meeting proton decay limits and, and unifying exactly with the extra dimensions. So there is no other thing that you have to consider with unification scale. And there are no other constraints that one has to take into account when reaching such a low God scale. So you have to go proton decay. Yes, of course. So, so you have to you have to there are a lot of extra fields. So you have to take care of them. And the for us the strongest one is the gluino, which kind of comes to us about uh, above two TVs. So this is another strong TV uh, constraint. There are many other fields, but they are way well above the constraints that we have to look. So yes, you have to look up every every extra field and see that it meets the, its corresponding constraints. Okay, thanks. So another question. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, let me let um, me Joel. let me ask. One. Thanks. Um, so so here, um, I guess I guess you have our parity violation. Yes, right. of course, we um, do. Yeah. No scale. So, so um, I'm sure this is on, on the mind of, of my uh, other co hosts. Um, uh, do you have a dark matter candidate? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, 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 of course, uh, the, in, indeed, as, as you say, you can see that we have our parity violation by the fact of, of the, the web that I'm, I'm looking for it. So, this web. It has a, a web in the S neutrino, so the S neutrino is, is positive, has positive parity. So we have the the LSP is of course not stable in this setup, so it's not a viable dark matter candidate. However, the, the we even though we haven't analyzed this in full details, we have the L LKP. So in similar, the the lightest KK mode is stable, and in this setup for us it is, and even though it's going to be a bit uh, massive, more, much more than the, the standard uh, mass for a WIMP or something like that, we have a strong degeneracy because there's uh, too many modes that have that scale and we, we have to study that. So this is one of the, the possibilities to have a dark matter candidate. Super, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, another question? Maybe for the, let me check just very few. Okay, in, in, in YouTube, we have some comments, but not a not question at the moment. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, also I have a question. Um, Francisco, when, when you were talking about the, that in principle, you can have CISO mechanism. Uh, what do you expect for the scale of this CISO? Is, is it a CISO? That is compatible with neutrino. Yes. Matrix. So because so, since you have the unification scale so low and usually in the yes, of course. So 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 high. So you have to. There is something very interesting. It actually really fits the scale. So when you think of the the, the Majorana masses for right-handed neutrinos, you immediately think of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 14 uh, GVs for right-handed uh, neutrino masses, and that scale comes from the fact that you assume the the rack neutrino masses to be of the size of the quark masses of the up quark masses so if you have a natural uh, direct neutrinos you say a hundred gvs or something like that for us that that's not the case if you see the quarks have a leading order mass but leptons do not so we this is actually this is, every time you we write this it's about it's one loop suppression and one over lambda so there's already about two or three orders of magnitude uh, of difference between the, the Dirac neutrino masses and the quark mass ones. So that means that let's say two orders of magnitude and the below, you to get the, the CISO mechanism that, that two orders of magnitude suppression enters twice. So you get 10 to the minus four, the, the usual uh, scale. So if the usual scale is 10 to the 10, 10 to the minus four is 10 to the six, which is exactly our unification scale and or Majorana mass scale. So it, it kind of fits too. 
Ah, okay. So yeah, yeah, because uh, I was wondering because of the of because of the CISO scale, because usually since you you mentioned that the the your GAT scale was very low, so yeah, maybe much much smaller. Yeah. yeah, of course it, it works with usual GATs, but since our leptons are already suppressed, it it also works due to the, the suppression that comes from the Dirac mass of the neutrino. Yeah. Okay. So we we just like. Uh, uh, Joel told me that there is a, a question in the YouTube chat. I'm going to read it to you. It's from yeah. Celine Gomez. Yeah. Uh, first of all, he's saying, congratulations, like, very nice, Francisco. Presumably, all the folding choices are in turn the result of 10 dimension gravitational dynamics. How can we know if this particular choice is even possible? He's asking. So the, the, we are ignoring gravity, so there, there are no, no constraints from, from gravity. The only the only constraints that, that we have to take into account is coming from the purely Poincaré. We have Poincaré symmetry. And of course, the Poincaré symmetry, the, for, coming from the fact that this is, a, the, this is our symmetry. So coming from the fa fact that we have a subgroup of Poincaré, this have to fulfill some consistency conditions. So that limits us of, uh, greatly on what choices can we do. So, so, but of course, this is one of the choices that uh, that that is viable for that uh, we don't consider gravity so, so there are no extra constraints in there but for gl uh, lo uh, global symmetry global poincare symmetry we, we meet every constraint that that is necessary okay maybe i don't know if selim will have uh, would have some uh, further questions but he, yeah. he's gonna write it in the chat then yeah if you want to to explore more so I don't know if there are other questions because we still have, I mean, I would have another one to ask <laughs> because you, you were mentioning and in, indeed that you have some minimal constraint, but uh, during your talk also, you, you mentioned the flavor symmetries. Here, you, do, you do you have kind of a particular flavor structure for your- So- you to have so mixing, in, left the mixing or what mixing at the Yukawa matrices? So we have uh, the flavor symmetry for us is SU3. SU3 flavor. So in, in uh, as we have a, a bunch of SU3s, of course, we have these this symmetries, right? So we have the color left, right, and flavor symmetry. So the, the flavor symmetry is fully uh, determined from uh, SU3. It's a continuous symmetry. It's not the standard uh, discrete symmetries. And if you see here, this is the, the, the what would give us the structure, the flavor structure is that this bev has some specific flavor structure, which is going to be, uh, can be chosen by hand, but through the Wilson lines. So you can choose these three bevs by hand because it's a, this, this is a, a construction of the orbifold and that would generate all of the, all of the, the structure. We haven't did, done the fit because uh, if you see, saw the, the running of the gauge coupling, of course, the Yukawa is going to feel our strong running too, and that's really more complicated to, to do. But we're hopeful from the simple structure in here, it, it seems like it may work. We'll see if it does. Okay. Ah, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, and a little question, another question, because usually when, when people discuss about the uh, gratification theories, in general, not in this specific setup. Uh, usually, one of the points to, to discuss is the stability of the proton. How yeah. the, how this scheme uh, affects so the, proton stability? Because since you have the GATT scale, so, such lower values. Yeah, that you know, that, that was the, the the idea that this is the main the main decay mode for the proton. So there is no higher order, so lower order. Uh, proton decay term. So if you see, this is a really complicated uh, diagram and it gets really, really suppressed. So this precisely, this is what also allows us to go that low scale. So proton decay is practically the, the main constraint when you talk about guts. So the fact that this is so constrained for us allows us to do that. Otherwise we wouldn't. I'm sorry. Sorry, what's antimetry? Go <laughs> Yeah, what, what was the question? Antimetry, you say suppressed by antimetry? So the, 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 it's suppressed by, you have to, there are main, mainly, so this is the, 
mainly two things that that highly suppress is the fact that you have to build a diagram for proton decay coming from the KK modes from from the original setup. You cannot just write any any diagram. You have to have the fields from the start. And these these modes they couple in in some way. For example, to in here, this coupling, it has to, with this field, which is not the standard model, it's not a zero mode. You have to do one loop to convert it into, the, into a standard model field that gives a lot of suppression. And then you do the, the same thing to the other one, but if they are the same, QR, QR, if they were the same in here, the anti-symmetry would make the, that, that uh, diagram vanish because you have an anti-symmetry for every SU3 involved. So you have to make them different, both legs. And, that each step lowers and lowers the, 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 the constraint for us. And of course, the, the, the good news is that it unifies at a very low uh, gauge coupling. And, seeing, and seeing, since it appears a lot of times, 18 times, that the constraints allow the protein decay. Right. But, um... In, in this case, okay, you're, you're calculating the operator at, at, that, at the gut scale uh, where the coupling is, is small, but in principle, this should be, uh, um, uh, you, sh you should run this to, the, to, the, to a lower scale and there, there could be effects from operator mixing or things like this. Yeah. So, and and have, you, have you checked that? So it, we, we didn't, of course, that, that's, that's something that we consider that there's something nice uh, to, uh, that makes us uh, hope. So we can assume that there, there's not going to be much changes. One of the things is that these X uh, fields only lives in, in the very last. So if you see that there are different KK modes that die, so that X fields is one of the first to die is the actually the first to die at the first compactification. So that's why we have to choose this, this coupling at that com, uh, unification, then at that unification scale, then we would have to run as a, as a composite operator. We would have to run it, but since it's a composite, uh, we don't expect it to run as much as, as just the gauge coupling does. So, so we, with that, I think that's a fair assumption that we are we are safe. But we, of course, we have to do that. The problem is that it gets really complicated. You see how much the the this running affects. So we didn't do the calculation exactly. Yeah. Okay. I have a question, Francisco. Yeah. Uh, but this is from. I mean, I have no idea about E eight. But I remember when I was a student in Texas uh, back in the 2008 or something like that, that there was some controversy around uh, about uh, Lisi's work on yes. E8, and then yeah. there were like two. And then so one of my one of the faculty in my in my group I remember that he he used to insist a lot and and actually uh, published something saying that it was not possible to embed the three generations of fermions in E8 and that. That there was no exceptional uh, unified theory in it, uh, and then and then that died. And I think the next time that I heard about this is now. So it, does this build uh, on anything related to that, or, or what is different from this that uh, no, so that would be exempt there, from that criticism? Yeah. So the, there is something that is very different from the so the the Lisi's work of what I think it doesn't work. So I don't have it the, that the composition written in here, but E eight. So E8, it decomposes into, you can break it down into SO10 cross SO4. So what Gareth Lisi said is that this SO4 is kind of like SU3 comma one, kind of like the Lorentz symmetry. So that is the, that is that weird assumption to make. So the, he wanted to make a full unified theory and make Lorentz come from E8. So when you, make Lorentz come from E8, so that SO4, you lose our uh, SU, SU4, SU3, sorry. So then you lose the three generations. So you can only have one generation. And even then getting Lorentz in there is, is kind of uh, weird to do. But yeah, when, when he does that, you lose the flavor symmetry for the Lorentz symmetry. So he cannot make a full unification anyway. That's the problem with, this, with that theory. 
we don't you we use that for the flavor symmetry so we do have the three families in there okay thank you So, uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, are there other questions? Because I don't know if the, because I, I have one very, very, I mean, not naive, but in the sense that uh, which are the um, implication of this uh, realization of the standard model, but, but from the point of view of cosmology, because since you have a, a gut scale so low, maybe yeah. it's gonna mess up with some processes at the early universe, not, not at the level of inflation, but maybe a little bit after it's going to change the, the abundances of particles or something like that, with yeah. such a low scale, because 10 to the 7, oh. GV or 10 to the 6 is not so far. So no, I'm it, it yeah, yes, really of course. So it, it will surely uh, affect, uh, I, I cannot answer exactly uh, what are the implications in, in cosmology, but of course it, it it's, one of the first things to come to mind because it, it, it will change a lot, but I, 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 I really cannot know for now. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't know if there are other questions in, in YouTube. I mean, there were a comment for, from Fefo to, to Selim. Yeah. Selim can, for sure, he, he, he's reading the, the YouTube chat. So I don't know if there are other questions. Otherwise, no, I guess it's... Ah, I'll ask one more. <laughs> yeah, we have a little bit more time, so let's let's go for it. So, so yeah. uh, uh, later later in, in, in the talk, you um, um, show how the running breaks SU two symmetry, right? Um, um, radiatively, you also say it's, uh, in that same slide that there are no flavor changing neutral currents. So I would like to know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Since so you don't have, a, yeah, go go. Yeah, so, so the idea is this, if you, if you remember from the field content of the, that we have, mm -hmm. we have six Higgses. So we have three pairs mm -hmm. and that immediately is a red flag for fla flavor changing neutral currents. So, and so, okay, okay. That's so I mean. that, that's, that, yeah. And, and what I'm meaning here is that if you see, uh, when we run the, the, the masses, only one goes really down and into the electroweak scale, but the other one stays up. So the Higgs, the, the, the standard model Higgs is going to be the 125 GBs. And the next one is going to be about the compactification scale, uh, 10 to the five, 10 to the six. So the mixing is going to be negligible. So that there is, there is no fear of having excessive flavor changing neutral currents. Right. It coming coming from there, right? Because you you again have the the the, the flavor chain neutral currents coming from the from the structure of the soft SUSI breaking terms and this kind of thing. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, again, almost every every single S particle has that scale. Uh, tend to, so almost everything that is extra to the standard model uh, oh. has that the PV scale. Okay, so, so because you were mentioning light gluinos, so I, I thought there were some other light particles. So yeah, the, so, so what actually are the, your the, lightest particles there? So the, uh, that way I, I, I said almost everything. So the okay. ev everything receives a, a, a mass like that uh, directly when the SUSI breaking, except the geginos. The mm. geginos receive a mass at two loops. So it, it doesn't happen exactly at, at the PEV, so it, it, they are brought down. So gluinos, mm. which are the more, more constrained, they have to be about two TVs. Hmm. And for us, I think it, 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 when you run them down, you get them at about four TV, something like that. That's the lightest uh, new particle mm -hmm. that, that is predicted by this model. And it, it's really close yes. to, to detection if it were true. So spectrum is like this uh, split SUSI um, where the geginos are light and the, and the scalars. The, the geginos are much lighter than the, than the, than the scalars, I yes. I see. Okay. Okay. And that's one of the nice things that we don't have to play with the soft SUSI. This is completely defined. So they are fixed. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we, don't, we didn't do anything to obtain this. This happens. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So if there are no other questions, I guess we are okay with time. 
So we thank Francisco de Anda for such a nice talk and, and very interesting model because to, to have the, the Thunder model embedded in E8 is not, it's not easy. <laughs> <I will say. laughs> it could be very complicated to, 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 to make it and they succeeded. So very nice. So, okay. Thank you, Francisco, for all the rest of the people that is following us. Remember that we are going to have a little break until the end of January, uh, yeah. so at the end of uh, August, after the summer break or winter break, depending on the side of the world in which you are. And we are going to meet again soon and keep in touch with, uh, with us via the social network and the YouTube channel and have a good day for everybody. So, thank you very much. Bye. Okay, ya no estamos transmitiendo.